our UCSF Youth Substance Use Program talk on identifying high quality substance use disorder treatment programs for youth. It's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Veronica Misharkova, who is an adolescent medicine pediatrician and is the medical director for the Youth Substance Use Disorders Program. Emily Tajani is a psychiatrist specializing in addiction uh, psychiatry, and she, um, she co-facilitates the Youth Substance Use Disorder Program and also works in private practice. With that, I'll turn it over um, to uh, both uh, speakers. And before that, I just wanted to invite folks to, um, to type any questions that you have throughout into the chat. We will have some time for question and answer at the end. Um, if there are certain clarifying questions that really you know, need to, um, that warrant a pause, uh, as the presentation is going, then we can do that. But for the most part, we'll try to save the questions for the end, but please feel free to type them in as soon as the questions occur to you. Okay, well, thank you everybody for joining us. And again, I just wanna emphasize that we do wanna leave time at the end of the presentation to make sure that we can engage in a really rich discussion because I think um, this is an area where really rich discussion as possible and important. Um, so um, I will try to uh, manage, uh, go through my slides um, in a more efficient manner so that we can have time for discussion. Okay, so uh, objectives today, hopefully after this uh, presentation, all of you should be able to advise families on um, how to uh, prioritize co-occurring psychiatric conditions. We'll talk and introduce the ASAM levels of addiction treatment, explain the appro approach to treatment matching, discuss characteristics of high quality addiction treatment programs, differentiate between clinical treatment and community or peer support programs, comment on barriers to treatment access for patients using medication for the treatment of opioid use disorder, and provide guidance on program aspects to approach with caution. Okay, so just to set the stage, why are we talking about this? Why is this important? Um, looking at the epidemiology of substance use disorders, here this is data from the 2019 National Survey on Drug Use and Health, and this shows uh, rates of substance use disorders among different age groups, and we're focusing mostly on this gray line of 12 to 17 year olds and the blue line of 18 to 25 year olds. Um, and as you can see, the uh, Adolescents, 12 to 17, have relatively low rates of substance use disorder. Look at what happens when people reach age 18, right? The most common, uh, the most uh, common time to to struggle with a substance use disorder in that is in that transitional age youth um, time period. And we also know that drug overdose deaths are on the rise. This is um, showing drug overdose death rates for 15 to 19 year olds between 1999 and 2015, we can see the sharp increase. And this is looking at multiple um, age groups up through 2019. And here you can focus on the 15 to 24 year olds. You see that drug overdose deaths continue um, to rise. And interestingly, when we think about top causes of death among adolescents, we don't often think about drug overdose, or at least I didn't. Um, so here breaking this down, we know that the number one cause of death in adolescence is unintentional injury, followed by suicide and homicide. And when we break down, well, what is in that unintentional um, injury category? We see that number one is motor vehicle crashes, but second to that, within that unintentional injury category is, uh, is poisonings, which um, if we break that down further, we know that most of those are uh, due to opioid overdose and are unintentional. Okay. And unfortunately, despite this information, we also know that most youth do not receive addiction treatment. Um, 90 to 95% of youth with alcohol use disorders, illicit drug use disorders, or combination of substance use disorders really get nothing. And there are many barriers and, and reasons why people don't get appropriate treatment. Looking at patient level barriers, and I can't emphasize the first uh, bullet point enough, 
Um, most youth in need of treatment do not consider their substance use problematic, right? So the buy-in most of the time is not there. And we know that Black adolescents and adolescents with private insurance are the least likely to be involved in treatment. So there are um, some disparities as well um, when it comes to who, who does and doesn't get um, treatment. There's also a lot of family member ambivalence about need for treatment, right? And this goes all hand in hand with the adolescent's perception that their substance use isn't problematic, right? Even if a parent or loved one may be worried about that adolescent, um, they may be met with a lot of skepticism, right? Like, why is everyone overreacting? It's not a problem. Um, and a lot of family members really think that Substance use is normative. It's something that the adolescents will grow out of. They'll learn their lesson, I hear a lot of uh, people say. And so they often don't pursue treatment. And then there's also a lot of family member disengagement after initiation of treatment, right? So a, a family member may bring their child into treatment and then kind of say, okay, I'm done. You know, you're the one with the problem, you're in treatment you know, take it from here, this is no longer my problem, right? And they kind of see the substance use disorder as something episodic, um, something that, you know, they'll, it's a phase, they'll grow out of it, I got them into treatment, nothing else to do. And then another major barrier is really a lack of understanding of what treatment actually is. And we'll get into that on the next slide a little bit. When it comes to systems level barriers to treatment, um, these are significant. One is lack of diagnostic clarity. So as we think of any other diagnosis that we treat, first step is actually making a diagnosis. And oftentimes with substance use disorders, what I see is that that diagnosis never gets made, right? We see, um, you know, statements like polysubstance use or, you know, um, other kind of very generalized uh, mention uh, of someone's substance use behavior without actually assessing for the presence of a DSM-5 um, use disorder. And I find that when a diagnosis isn't made, it's less likely to get appropriate treatment, right? Um, so, that, so that makes sense. There's also uh, tends to be a one size fits all approach, especially in adolescent treatment. Um, I see it frequently where, you know, anytime an adolescent is using drugs at all, the immediate reaction is like send them to residential, right? Regardless of what the diagnosis is, the severity of the diagnosis, or any individual level factors for that patient. There's also a lot of peer support um, recommended as treatment. Right, um, so a, a young person comes to clinic, they're reporting concerning substance use, and oftentimes providers may say, well, just go to AA or go to NA, right? And that's really the only recommendation that is made. Um, and then there's also this kind of binary approach of like patients get either no treatment at all or they go all the way to residential treatment. So kind of that like one size fits all. Another major issue, issue that I'm you know, frustrated with on a almost daily basis is treatment silos. So in our mental health system, we've separated these disorders um, into different treatment settings, right? So we have youth who are struggling with an eating disorder. Well, there's programs that only use eating disorders, right? We have youth that struggle with addiction. Well, the programs that you know are there to treat addiction really say we have no experience in how to address an eating disorder or we have a youth who has suicidality um, plus substance use um, they go to inpatient psychiatry and that maybe that inpatient program says whoa we don't know what to do with the substance use right so there's these silos of you know only one condition can be treated in one treatment program when we know the evidence shows that concurrent treatment of these commonly co-occurring disorders is what's most effective. And there's also realistically a lack of treatment options. There are, you know, a uh, few programs that actually treat adolescents in an adolescent age appropriate way. Um, I think a study I looked at recently showed that about only 35% or so offer adolescent specific treatment. And then, um, when, when we look at programs, the, what's offered at the programs often tends to vary. It's very eclectic. Um, so it's hard to know 
well, what's an appropriate program? Because there's really no standard offerings. And of course, financial and insurance ba barriers are very real. So for example, in San Francisco, um, there are absolutely zero residential treatment options for youth with Medi-Cal. There are none. Um, so this presents a real barrier. And even patients who have, you know, excellent health insurance, um, the, the parity that we're supposed to be seeing with physical and mental health um, often isn't borne out. Um, and so accessing appropriate treatment because of insurance barriers is sometimes impossible. And finally, there's also some discriminatory practices that I've run into. So um, one that I'd like to particularly point out is rejection of patients with opioid use disorders. So I have a number of youth who are doing quite well with medication treatment of their opioid use disorder, but they have co-occurring disorders that also need to be addressed in a higher level of care. And unfortunately, because they are receiving medication for their opioid use disorder, they get rejected from other psychiatric programs or eating disorder programs or what have you, which is actually against the law. Um, and yet, because enforcement of these laws is really non-existent, um, those patients really still struggle to access appropriate treatment. And this paper um, from 2020 actually showed that even after there was this anti-discrimination settlement in Massachusetts, that settlement really did nothing to change the rates at which patients were being rejected um, solely because of their um, opioid use disorder. And speaking of co-occurring conditions, one question that I often get from parents and from um, my colleagues is how to prioritize treatment when there's numerous things going on, right? And so this is just kind of, it, it's much more complex than this, but if you're thinking about it, start with what's most likely to result in uh, mortality risk, right? So someone who has active suicidality, that always comes first. After that, overdose deaths, severe withdrawal syndromes from substance use disorder substance-induced psych psychotic disorders where patients may get themselves into really dangerous situations. And then I always put anorexia nervosa in there. Anorexia nervosa is one of the deadliest um, psychiatric diagnoses. So making sure that um, when there's no active suicidality and there's substance use presence, as long as the patient isn't at risk for immediate overdose death or psychosis or severe withdrawal syndromes, really thinking about that eating disorder as kind of a priority. And then really working on maybe a mild or moderate substance use disorder. Now I'm going to be brief about levels of addiction treatment and we can get into this a little bit more in the discussion for interest of time. Um, but I want everyone to know about the ASAM criteria. So this is American Society for Addiction Medicine. This is a really thick detailed book um, and it outlines um, a spectrum of uh, addiction treatment options. And I would just focus on level one is outpatient services. Level two is intensive outpatient or partial hospitalization services. Level three is residential. And level four is uh, medically managed, really intensive hospital-based services. So this is available through a Google search if you need a reminder, but it, it, there is a continuum of care. And ASAM really recommends a thoughtful, methodical approach to determining which of those levels of care is appropriate for any given patient um, that takes into account um, six dimensions that are important to assess um, when you're working with a patient with a substance use disorder. So I won't read the dimensions to you here, but just introducing you to the idea that um, it's really a complex consideration when we're thinking about levels of care. Um, and briefly, just a quick outline of what are these levels of care. Level one is outpatient services. So the UCSF Youth Outpatient 
substance use program is a level one um, program. And this basically means that the patient has a diagnosed use disorder, um, but is fairly stable in all of those six domains that I showed you and can really um, make it to appointments, can focus on, on treatment, doesn't have any medical conditions that need intensive monitoring and offer, and programs like this offer about six or few hours of service per week. Level two are those intensive outpatient or partial hospitalization services. Again, the main thing to take away from these slides is that it's an additional hours in a more controlled environment. So for someone who is really having trouble focusing, can't make it to appointments necessarily, um, outpatient may not be enough to meet their needs. And so a more structured environment may be appropriate. Um, so that was, and this is partial hospitalization. So more hours, additional hours, more structure. Level three, residential services and inpatient services. Um, I would say I see a lot of adolescents um, get sent immediately to level three type services, um, residential services. Um, and this, all of these involve, you know, 24 hours of structured care. Um, and I want to point out what I've bolded and, and, high, and underlined here is that, you know, a clinically managed medium intensity residential program, this is really, we're talking about um, dysfunction in multiple dimensions of that six dimension assessment and imminent danger. Okay, so um, for me, when I'm thinking about this, this really means, you know, this youth is um, really at high risk of opioid overdose. They may be regularly driving under the influence. They are going to, you know, putting themselves in really dangerous situations when they're going to obtain their substance, um, things like that. So we're really worried about this imminent danger for the youth. And briefly touching on level four, this is um, a really high level kind of hospital setting. Um, and this is when someone is at high risk of seizures from withdrawal syndromes, things like that, 24 hour nursing care, daily physician contact. And I will uh, give it up to, um, give it to uh, Dr. Tajani to go from here. Great, thank you. Um, just gonna share my screen here. All right, can everyone see that okay and hear me okay? All right, um, now that we have an overview of the different levels of care available for people with uh, SUDs, I'm gonna walk us through uh, how we might go about finding programs, um, whether that's outpatient, residential or intensive outpatient, and how we can try to uh, determine and sort through the better quality versus lower quality programs. Um, so let's take a look here. I, oh, sorry, one sec here. There we go. And ideally uh, this information will help you be able to do so quickly. I'll point out here that there uh, is a SAMHSA website where you can go and you can put in your location and what sort of treatment you're looking for, substance use, mental health, or both. And it will bring up a list of uh, different treatment programs, including various levels of care in that area. And this looks like a great resource and it is certainly better than nothing. Um, unfortunately, there's not um, much in the filter section, uh, which you can't quite see here, but if you click on filter, you will just see further geographical information. There's no way to put in age of patient or what type of um, SUD or whether uh, there's a certain level of care required. So it's a good starting point. Um, it does seem to include just about any program, I believe, that wants to be included. And I'm not um, entirely sure if there's any screening out, but it doesn't look like it. I just did a little search in my area in Marin, and there were a few programs that came up, um, all for programs I'm familiar with. And while they each have their different strengths and weaknesses, um, you know, many of the programs on this list have uh, at times not either offered evidence-based care, or maybe they offer really great care, but they're extremely expensive. Um, many of them don't treat youth. So it's 
probably not going to be the most helpful to those of you who see young people and are, who are looking for good quality of care for your patients. Um, there's also something called treatment match. Uh, this group, I, I can't remember what the acronym stands for, but they offer some great resources on uh, buprenorphine treatment and opioid use disorder. They also have the, a separate section where you can anonymously uh, request addiction treatment. Again, not a lot of filters. Uh, it's not clear if people under 18 can request. I just filled out the link to kind of see what would happen. They send the request into some sort of system um, where it looks like providers have signed up to accept patients. And a day or two later, this is the response I got. And again, better than nothing, um, I X'd out some of the um, identifying information of this clinician. I, I believe it's a physician. Um, they're not in my area. It's a telemedicine practice. They don't accept insurance. Um, they have some interesting sort of membership deal with a free initial month, which kind of uh, is something I'm more familiar with, with joining GEMS, not so much medical care. They may be able to refer to counseling. So there are, you know, signs that are a little bit concerning and that they don't seem to really offer the full um, standard of care that we would expect or like a young person with a drug or alcohol issue to receive. So we may not be able to find care super quickly, at least not at first. Um, it's gonna take a little effort to be able to identify uh, treatment programs that reliably offer good care, that are affordable if needed, and that have beds available. And unfortunately, this beds available um, uh, criteria has become a little more difficult to find, as I'm sure all of you are aware since the start of the pandemic. Um, there has been a substantial increase nationally in young people presenting to the emergency room for psychiatric uh, or addiction treatment. And in a recent JAMA um, uh, research letter, they found that young people presenting to the ED were more likely to need admission and um, were requiring longer lengths of stay. I do want to point out that we can talk about what to do if there aren't beds available at the end. We can have a discussion about that. Um, but just a couple of quick practical tips. Um, often we will need to think about safety first and consider whether there's an imminent safety issue if we can't find a bed for a young person. So if someone's using opioids, making sure they have naloxone at home, um, referring them to a center or a doctor who can prescribe buprenorphine, that can sometimes be easier to find than a full um, menu of therapeutic programming. Uh, and then thinking about whether uh, there's other types of substance use that could lead to imminent harm that we may need to address um, in a more sort of acute uh, and intensive way. So I wanted to just create a list of the things to think about when evaluating a treatment program or if a patient comes to you and says, here's a center and this is what they offer, does this sound good? Or if you're trying to call and make a referral for a patient, I actually use some of the principles um, from uh, ethical medical practice to uh, kind of organize this and differentiate it because it fit nicely with the things that I know I look for when I'm trying to find patients higher levels of care. So this idea of beneficence, you know, is the treatment likely to help? Um, essentially, do they offer evidence-based treatment or the standard of care? Veracity, does the program and staff seem honest? Do they tend to be forthright? Fidelity, do they actually do what it says they do, say on their website? There's a lot of what, nice websites out there, um, but sometimes the reality is quite different. And then non-maleficence, um, we do need to think unfortunately about you know, the potential for harm with certain types of treatment since the addiction treatment uh, sector is not very highly regulated. There is the potential for harm and that's true for just about any type of medical intervention. Um, for young people who use drugs, they are at especially high risk of harm from low quality treatment, and there are studies that show that. This is a uh, bar graph from a paper that was published in 2004, a while ago, but it's the only one I could find that looked at programs for youth with addiction and tried to kind of rank the quality of the programs. And it only included programs that um, experts in the field uh, said were you know, high quality, that were excellent. And even from these excellent programs, you can see that a 
that, that based on the key markers of high quality youth care, many of them were not um, meeting all of these markers. If anything, there were few programs out there that routinely um, provided sort of the key elements of high quality addiction treatment. Uh, there are a lot of uh, veracity and fidelity concerns. Many of you may be familiar with the book or the movie Beautiful Boy and like the issue of trust, how hard it can be for a doctor or a parent or for a patient to know if they can trust a treatment center or its staff. Um, and recently there was a book just published called Troubled. It's been getting a lot of press uh, on NPR and other news outlets. And it's uh, a autobiographical account of a young person who went into wilderness treatment. Um, and Dr. Masharikova will talk a little bit more about wilderness at the end. Let me just play this very I realized quickly. early on, there was nothing that I was doing, nor anything any of my research buddies were doing that was leading to something as practical as, where do I send my kid for treatment? And here you are, a doctor specializing in addiction, but you, you didn't know where to turn. You didn't know yeah. Where to seek out help. Yeah, and I underline, I'm an expert. If I don't know, nobody else knows. I realized earlier. Sorry. So uh, that is Dr. Thomas McClellan. He is a uh, highly published, highly regarded uh, research, uh, re addiction researcher. And he used to work for the Obama administration and the National Center for Drug Policy. He sadly lost his own child um, to uh, addictive disorder uh, about 15 years ago, 20 years ago. Um, and it really prompted him to try to change this longstanding history of programs not being held accountable. And I share this for a number of reasons, but primarily to let everyone here know that you're not alone when you're struggling to find um, good addiction care for, for patients or for friends or family members. It is hard, but it's getting easier. So let's talk about the ways in which it's getting easier. I really... Okay, so he started a group initially called Treatment Resource Center. It's now called um, Family Resource Center. And this is a great resource. I have the website there. Um, they cover all the main topics that primary care docs or e even parents uh, will have in mind and want answers on regarding how to find treatment, what sort of treatment to look for. And what I really like about it is for each topic, they cover uh, the scientific background for the recommendation. And they are uh, highly collaborative with uh, Partnership, the Partnership to End Addiction, which is a large nonprofit group that also has wonderful resources, largely aimed at parents parents of young people who have drug or alcohol problems, but many of the resources would be helpful for uh, pediatricians, even general psychiatrists, and kind of sorting through and navigating the addiction treatment sector. Um, they offer text communication and uh, live support to parents and probably uh, primary care docs as well and have some great advice like prepare to be called a hypocrite or I'm stressed and exhausted and don't think I can handle that. Um, they also have some good guides about what to look for and what to avoid when searching for an addiction treatment program. They have some links to a group called the Center for Motivation and Change, which offers a wonderful guide called the 20 minute guide. There's a parent's version and a partner version, and it has like bullet point practical advice about how to help motivate your loved one or your child to go into treatment, because we know that is also a major barrier to getting kids good care. A lot of kids, as Dr. M mentioned earlier, they don't want to go to treatment initially, or they may not express that they want or are willing to go. So there's some really wonderful practical advice here. Um, and all of these organizations, all of these groups, uh, do a wonderful job at spreading the message that you can still help your child or your adolescent patient, even if they are not expressing an interest in going to treatment, that that's often the first phase. And there are ways to help even, you know, when the person is not yet motivated to get help. Um, so 
the last part that I want to go through today with you are some indicators that I hope will be practically useful and won't take too much time to you know think about and sort through when you have a patient in front of you who clearly needs a higher level of care. Um, perhaps they're thinking about going to a residential or an intensive outpatient program, and the family is asking you know for your recommendations or referrals. Um, I kind of think about five uh, key indicators, and I will go over some specifics for each of these. We want to think about the quality of the medical treatment, the therapy program, the clinical staff, and then we want to look to make sure it is uh, family-based, that it, it doesn't just sort of address the young person's needs, but it thinks about the family system. And we also want to ensure that the programming is developmentally appropriate and informed. Okay, so let's start with the clinical staff. And what I'm about to share with you, there's really not research on this, but you know, in nearly a decade now of practicing in the community, not initially knowing which programs were good or not so good in my area. These are the things that I kind of learned to do over the years to find good care for my patients who needed something beyond an outpatient solo, you know, practice doc. And these are also things I've talked about with all of my addiction medicine and addiction psychiatry colleagues in the area that we spend a lot of time thinking and talking about this because it's been frustrating to figure out, you know, how do we know where to send people? So with clinical staff, one thing that can be helpful to look for you know, and sort of like a quick and dirty way to kind of rule out a rule and is, do they have a physician on staff? And ideally a physician who, who's a psychiatrist and do they have some therapists who are um, master's level trained? Ideally, most of the therapists will be master's level and even better, maybe they have a PhD or PsyD on staff. A lot of programs you will find if you look closely, their therapists have a degree called a KDAC, um, Certified Addiction Alcohol and Drug Counselor. That's what it stands for. You don't need an undergraduate degree. You don't need an associate's degree um, to become a KDAC. You need 315 online hours of training. You do need 3,000 practicum hours, but that can include volunteering probably in any role, like maybe cleaning or making food in, a, in some sort of addiction treatment setting. And it can be done in a year. I've heard sometimes six months. Um, and you can see how much more training a master level clinician such as an MFT has. So there are programs that will have maybe one MFT and a lot of KDACs and perhaps um, most of their clinicians will have a little eye after their degree, which means they're still uh, in training and they're not yet licensed. So the, the more highly trained and licensed and credentialed, the better. I'm not gonna verbally go through these. I'll save most of these questions for you to reference later, but these are the sorts of questions I ask when I call a treatment center, say a patient wants to go back East to go to residential. I will call um, the intake person. Sometimes I'll ask for the clinical director, depending on the program. Um, and these are the sorts of things that I ask. I really can't emphasize enough to make sure that the physician is um, a psychiatrist or at least uh, has some addiction training, say a pediatrician or a primary care doctor with some additional addiction training. I've seen a lot of physicians with degrees that aren't at all relevant to treating young people or uh, not degrees, but um, residency training or specialties that aren't relevant to working in these settings on staff. Um, quality indicators of a medical program are that there is access, first of all, to medical care for both addiction and psychiatric disorders, um, and that, that uh, physician uh, or clinician is there on site providing care with some regularity, and that all patients coming into the program, particularly if it's a, a program for adolescents, get an assessment um, for the presence of psychiatric disorders. This is because co-occurring psychiatric disorders are so common, so prevalent in this population. And the data shows loud and clear that um, treating the psychiatric disorder alongside the addiction leads to much better outcomes than you know, doing one versus the other and having these treatment silos in place. Um, we also want to make sure that the medical care is evidence-based, and there's a few easy ways to kind of at least rule out programs that aren't offering evidence-based care. A really important question I ask is, do you offer patients with opioid use disorder buprenorphine? Um, I've had several discussions with other addiction psychiatry colleagues about how this is sort of like our, you know, million-dollar question. 
at least to rule out programs that we don't want to send patients to, even if our patient doesn't have an opioid use disorder, because if it's an addiction treatment program and they take patients with opioid use disorder, if they don't offer buprenorphine, that's a you know major absence of a very important, very evidence-based treatment. And it makes me, you know, kind of question and wonder about what the rest of the treatment is like. Um, so that's perhaps the most important and helpful one from that list. Uh, quality indicators of therapy programs, you know, you want to make sure that there's individual therapy offered and group therapy, a menu of evidence-based therapies, some of which I listed here. And ideally, the patient will be able to kind of create their own program, that there is some flexibility to individualize the treatment because we know that one-size-fits-all treatment is not the best approach. Um, a high-quality youth Pro addiction treatment program will be family-based, by which I mean there will be contact with parents, um, with youth consent, of course, and that family members will be seen as partners, not as adversaries. There are programs out there that tell parents um, things like, you know, you're the problem, you're, you need to go to a codependency course, and you're not allowed to have contact with your child, which clearly is not a help, you know, helpful thing. Um, recent JAMA article that is sort of relevant. And then lastly, we wanna make sure that the programming is developmentally appropriate. And the reason this is so important is developmentally informed treatment is likely to help um, improve outcomes in regard to patient engagement and retention. We know attrition rates are high in addiction treatment, especially for youth. Um, so we wanna look for programs that kind of keep this in mind and that find effective ways to incentivize young people to come to their first appointment and to keep coming back more or less after that. We wanna look for programs that don't penalize um, and automatically discharge patients when they show symptoms of their illness, such as when they perhaps relapse from time to time. Um, this is a list of things that young people say motivates them to stop using. So I won't go through all of these, we don't have time, but really it comes down to uh, finding the things that are important to them that are not perhaps going so well in their life due to the fact that they are using alcohol or drugs and allowing them to articulate what those things are and giving them some agency and autonomy in the process. Um, you know, one question I like to ask in addition to the buprenorphine one is uh, if AA meetings happen on the um, premise of the treatment program, I like to ask, can patients choose not to go if they don't want to go? We know that AA is effective for some people who have um, SUDs that it kind of improves outcomes beyond what treatment would. Um, but we know that that's not true for all patients. And there's actually some interesting research out there that shows when patients who don't wanna to go to AA are forced to go, it can actually worsen their outcomes. I also wanna point out here that while peer recovery groups and other supports can be very helpful to some patients, um, they're not the same as treatment. So we don't want people going to a, a, a treatment program that only offers that sort of programming. We do want licensed credentialed um, folks delivering the care, and we want the care to be largely evidence-based. Um, last slide here, my section is that there's lots of red flags to think about. Um, I probably won't walk through each of these verbally with you, but you can take a look at this and let me know if you have questions. Basically, any program that's very rigid, um, very optimistic, says they know exactly what's going on and exactly what type of treatment needs to happen, especially if they're saying that before they talk to the patient or family, that is a red flag if they try to guarantee outcomes and, you know, talk a lot more about the pools or the amenities than the staff and the program that they offer, you know, that's a cause for concern and pause. All right, I'm going to give it back here to Dr. Sharikova. Let me see if it is. There we go. Okay, there we go. So um, the last part of our um, slide presentation before we get to hopefully a very rich discussion is um, some cautions um, that I really wanted to point out in this discussion. So 
One that we often encounter is this secure transport to wilderness programs question, right? So for those of you who may not have heard of this, what this usually entails is unannounced removal from the home of the young person, often in the night while they're asleep in their bedroom, um, and involuntary transport to a facility where the youth is held um, and, in, and uh, you know, is, is expected to engage in, in some type of treatment. And a survey of youth who were um, engaging in outdoor behavioral health care showed that about 65% of those were quote unquote securely transported. Um, and unfortunately, um, you know, this, this type of um, scenario does not follow principles of trauma-informed care. If you can imagine um, people you don't know storming into your bedroom in the middle of the night um, to wake you up and put you in a vehicle to transport you to somewhere you don't want to be um, is, is, can be really tra traumatic. Um, and besides that, there's little, little evidence that shows that secure transport in any way improves outcomes for youth and may cause lasting harm, um, like post-traumatic stress um, reactions, et cetera. And so there was an interesting um, qualitative study done, just published in 2021. And I thought this was really powerful, this quote from a young person that was securely transported. And this person says, the people that kidnapped me didn't even tell me who they were or where I was going. They told my parents not to be in the house when they came in because they ended up telling me after the fact, if the parents are there and they see a kid going through this, you might have second thoughts and you just don't wanna be there. Nobody was in my house and these people just essentially kidnapped me from my house and I didn't know if they were gonna kill me or rape me. I didn't know where I was going, anything. I mean, you know, even if we just put ourselves in this scenario, how, how terrifying this would be. So this is definitely not something that I would ever recommend um, to, to engage a young person in addiction treatment. And then um, the other thing that is kind of trendy right now, a lot of programs offering quote unquote equine therapy. Um, and although lovely and beautiful and probably super fun, um, uh, unfortunately, there's really no scientific empirical evidence that there's benefit of this type of approach for any mental health condition. So if this is sort of a part of a program that's, you know, kind of a nice bonus, that's, that's great. Um, and I would still ask that program what other evidence-based approaches um, and therapies they offer um, so that the backbone of their entire program is not just really focused on kind of a uh, something that doesn't have a lot of empirical evidence. So those are just kind of some of the warnings I wanted to put out there. And um, that concludes the, the slides. And I'm going to stop sharing so that perhaps we can answer some questions and discuss and do a little bit more of a discussion. So thanks, everybody, for your attention. Yeah, please so speak up and join. Yeah, feel free to ask anything or share things you've encountered um, when you've tried to find more specialized care for your patients. And feel free to use the chat or unmute yourself, whatever you're most comfortable with. I want to ask about the secure transport question. Um, I mean, it makes sense, obviously, from the you know, trauma perspective to not have people come in and kidnap you from your house. Um, on the other hand, I think there's, you know, the, just the practical question of, you know, sometimes how, how do you get people to treatment other than through just motivational interviewing, which will hopefully get them to the facility, which will get them, you know, more engaged in treatment. And I mean, I, I guess I'll start with that. Dr. Yeah. Do you want to start with that one? Yeah, um, it's a great question. You know, it's a sort of real world. Um, this is what's happening right now. And what do I do sort of question? Um, I'd start by pointing out that we need to think about what we are treating here. And we need to think about short versus long term outcomes. Um, I've had so many patients over the years that have been taken from their homes in this way to treatment. And it is true that they um, stop using drugs for a period of time while they stay. Some kids 
run away and there have been um, deaths associated with that or with abuse at the facilities. But for the kids who stay in the program while they're there, there can be an improved SUD outcome. They're not uncommonly maybe the onset of a new psychiatric disorder such as now PTSD or a worsening you know depression or or other things um but the thing is all those kids leave eventually you can't stay in a um you know confined setting forever nor would you want a young person to and um the long-term outcome is really where things do not go so well and there is some research not a lot but there is research that kids who have poor quality treatment while at you know a few months out of treatment or maybe a little less their outcomes are about the same when you look at several years out um, the outcomes are worse than not having gone to treatment at all so this is why um, thinking about is there an immediate life or death issue if there is then there are some other things that you know, we can try and we might push a little bit more because the potential gain is probably, you know, the relative gain may be greater there. But outside of that, um, sometimes we have to patiently wait and it's hard um, and you can give parents support around that. You know, the sort of good news here is that most young people go to treatment for marijuana use disorder, cannabis use disorder, which fortunately is not um, lethal, at least not directly. And so while there can be some harm, there's tremendous potential for recovery. So patiently waiting is often the best answer while giving parents support and working with parents on how to help a young person um, have more change talk and maybe get that young person to a therapist who can then help with uh, motivational interviewing and CBT and contingency management approaches like positive reinforcement strategies. Really great thorough answer. And I think this is where I would um, add uh, an evidence practice called CRAFT, Community Reinforcement and Family Training. Um, uh, and basically, this is an approach where a, a concerned significant other mostly um, is working with a therapist, either one on one or in a group. And this approach is specifically designed for concerned significant others or parents of patients who do not want treatment. They're against treatment. And the craft approach is actually evidence based and effective in helping the family member support their loved one's decision to enter treatment. So it's actually really effective of, of, of getting that person eventually into treatment. And it actually improves the lives of that concerned significant other. So that parent um, uh, helps them deal with some of the stresses associated there. So as a very practical answer, I would go for something like craft. Yes, thank you for bringing that up. I can't believe I, I didn't, I forgot to mention craft. That's so important. There are studies in adults, it was developed for adults, but they have done studies in recent years in teens showing it's just as effective for young people as it is adults. Um, you know, around 75% of young people whose parents get trained in this will eventually enter treatment. Whereas um, using like the, no method or the Johnson intervention, which is more of what you might see in the movies, the ultimatum and the big, you know, gathering and sort of situation, those rates are about 20%. Um, and that 20 minute guide that I mentioned earlier is all based on craft principles. Thank you so much for such a wonderful talk. I'm noticing some of my primary care colleagues as part of the call and wondering if you have any guidance for, um, for pediatric primary care providers who um, may be the first ones to hear about a uh, you know, use substance use uh, problem and, um, and you know, until someone can get into high quality treatment, acknowledging that most places now that we know have had very long waiting lists, um, what kind of advice can you give to PCPs? Great question. So one, um, I'll just start with, I'm a pediatrician. I, I did do a fellowship in adolescent medicine, but you know, as a pediatrician, I've, I've done primary care pediatrics and have experienced that. And I think number one, I, was a, I would advise us as pediatricians to first start by checking our biases. And what the research shows is that pediatricians grossly underestimate risky substance use. So um, there was a study that showed that less than 5% 
um, uh, pediatricians can correctly identify a youth struggling with it with with severe substance use. So, so one, I would sort of recognize that that our training in general pediatrics doesn't really provide much for us to, to go on. Um, so, it, for that reason, I would encourage everybody to make sure you're using a validated universal screening tool um, for substance use screening. Um, and uh, in the meantime, um, that's a really hard one. So. One, I would say, just like you're doing today, know your, your colleagues and, and who you can call or refer to. So, um, you know, just having someone that you can talk to. And, and also there's the Substance Use Warm Line, which is a nationwide call center that's actually based at UCSF um, that anyone can call and say, hey, this is a situation, what can I do? And so some of my colleagues in addiction medicine here um, uh, staff that warm line, they know about us, they can refer you to us, they can um, guide you over the phone uh, about what to do in your clinic. Um, and in the meantime, uh, you know, having some frequent follow-up and um, trying your best to practice your MI and having a really non-punitive um, non-judgmental approach because what I tell myself is when I'm engaging youth is that if the only thing I can do is make them see the clinic as a non-threatening safe environment where I care about them and I care about their outcomes if that's all I can do um, that's already a win because people who have positive experiences in addiction treatment are more likely to return to treatment later in life, right? So, so really think of your role as maybe you're not the expert of this, maybe you're not gonna be the one to offer them treatment, but, but please be the one that offers a non-judgmental positive impression of healthcare providers. Yeah, just to echo that, that's such a, another great point. Um, these are young people who have decades ahead of them to potentially access addiction treatment, psychiatric care, and other care. So we want to set up a association of you know healthcare settings being a safe, supportive place where we are there to try to understand their concerns and work alongside them, not um, you know cause some sort of excessive anxiety and um, punishment that um, leads to not returning to care when they're older and maybe more interested and um, willing to accept help at that time. I also would add that those resources from Partnership and from Thomas McClellan's um, Family Resource Center, those are relatively new, at least the way that they now offer um, the information and the sort of easy to access guides and uh, support options. So I would encourage telling uh, parents that that's out there continuing to show up and check in with the patient, um, remembering that you know relationships, um, and alliance are an important part of um, healthcare outcomes. And by continuing to check in with the patient, even if you feel like there is not active change or anything you're actively prescribing, that that is likely to be helpful. And that just supporting the parent by helping them uh, be aware that they are, there are things they can do even when their child is not working with a professional that can help over the long run, but it takes time often. And follow up to that question, there, um, there was a question around, you know, which screening tools and someone had typed in and suggested the craft. And I'm wondering if there are any others. And then um, as part of that, you know, how do you um, advise PCPs to assess if something is really more on the very severe end of things and really requires, you know, more urgent um, treatment and how to um, activate that? Mm -hmm. So in our clinic, we are using the craft. Um, and one thing I note, um, it, just working with trainees, is that they know about the craft, they give the craft, but they sort of don't have that next step of how do you interpret the craft? And I feel like, um, so what I did is I finally hung up uh, a printed sheet of the interpretation of the craft, which basically shows that, you know, someone who answers, I don't know, three, I think three of those questions affirmatively, over 60% of people will have a diagnosable substance use disorder in, in that moment, right? So a lot of, I see a lot of trainees say like, craft of three, high risk for sub, you know, high risk of developing a substance use disorder. That's incorrect. So what the data actually shows is that it, it's a correlation study. If they answer a three, like 
the next step should be for you to, to assess diagnostically, really. Um, other tools are, um, there's an online tool called, ooh. Uh, FQBI, is that what yes. you're saying? Yeah. Yeah, you can access that on um, the NIDA website, which you can get to through NIH and other government links, I think through SAMHSA too. And that's a nice one because if you do it online, it'll just kind of walk you through the steps and the, you know, there's prompts. Um, there's also Teen Intervene, um, which is a evidence-based way of screening in primary care settings. I'm not very familiar with it. I, I don't know if you are, Dr. Mishirkova. Um, that's the one recommended on the partnership uh, groups site. What was this last? Um, S2BI? Yes. So if any of you are really technologically advanced and you're using like iPad-based screening, which is like, I wish, it'd be awesome. Um, S2BI is great for that. <laughs> So it sounds like um, the speakers have graciously agreed to kind of assemble all of the resources that they are mentioning here and we'll be able to send out to all of those who have registered for, for this. Um, one other question was around um, kind of system of care and wondering if there are any plans to replace Thunder Road as far as you know. Not that I know of. I, I am not super familiar with Thunder Road. Um, I heard years ago that it changed, uh, the, the, the type of care being offered was changed. I actually wasn't aware that they were still offering youth addiction treatment. I could be wrong about that. I just, Last I heard, I heard it was not in operation. And I believe it was, um, it's, it was a residential program for publicly insured youth. Um, and I, since I've been here in, at UCSF since 2014, I don't think I'm aware of anybody. I don't think I've had patients that have gone there. So I don't know when exactly it stopped operating, but as I said, currently right now for publicly insured youth in the San Francisco area, there is no residential treatment option, unfortunately. So I'm, I, I really hope that um, publicly insured youth at some point can access a really high quality evidence-based residential Program. Yeah, and I, and I would add um, my colleague, Dr. Jeff DeVito, who runs County Addiction Services here in Marin, when I asked him this question, you know, how does a youth in California who has Medi-Cal get residential level of care? He looked into it, it called Partnership, um, and there is one residential treatment center in all of California that will, that Medicaid will pay for, but you have to belong to a certain county. It depends on the county that you get your insurance from. And I didn't understand enough of the specifics about, you know, what determines if that county will pay for residential, but there's a complicated algorithm where some counties um, have a, a requirements that they have to provide a residential level of care for adolescents with um, SUD who need a, a residential care. And there is one place that's in the East Bay. Um, I don't know anything about the quality of that program, but there are counties out there that do not refer to that residential program. And I believe they may not be required to provide a residential level of care. Um, and so that is you know, obviously an area for improvement. There's, that's an issue. Yes, Advent is the name of the program that this is affiliated with Med Medicaid or takes Medicaid. We are at time. I wanted to thank, um, profusely thank Dr. Tijani and Dr. Michelle Kova for delivering such a timely and important talk on just the high prevalence um, and scope of substance use disorders in youth and the difficulty in accessing care, how we can understand and navigate services and figure out if they are evidence-based and, um, and also looking at youth reasons for quitting and for not quitting and considerations in family-based treatment. So um, with that, we will end here and hope to see you next time. Thanks everyone. Thank Bye. You.